All right, good morning to all of you. Uh, we shall continue our study on the book of Acts. So we are looking uh, in this book uh, at the story of the church, how the church uh, started and progressed uh, in the first uh, century as recorded by Luke. Now today we are at chapter 20, right? so please turn in your Bible right, to chapter 20. But just as a reminder for those who have been following this series, that Paul is still on his third missionary journey. Right? As we look at Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul is still on his third missionary journey. Now we are told, if you look at chapter 18 and verse 23, or chapter 18 and verse 23, that after spending some time there, and there refers to Antioch. So remember, at the end of verse 22, he was back home in his home church in Antioch. So he spent some time there, and then verse 23 says, after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Perigia, strengthening all the disciples. And so if you can look at the map, right, uh, on the screen, now you see that leaving his home church in Antioch, my far, uh, towards the end, my left, you see, now the first places he went to was in the region of Galatia. You see Galatia, uh, same place there, near there is Perigia. And he was visiting those uh, churches whom that he had, earlier planted the churches in places like Lystra and Iconium and Derby, right, in those regions, called here the region of Galatia and Perigia. Now, after that, right, he left for Ephesus, right? Now, we know that Ephesus was a city he had wanted to visit earlier, but he could not. But during his second missionary journey, now he just stop by for a little while at, in that city, leaving behind Priscilla and Aquila, and then he quickly uh, rushed home. And so he's coming back, right, this time on his third missionary journey to this city. One of the main cities he wanted to have ministry in. And so we learned that, in fact, in this city, he probably spent the most time, right? He spent three years in the city of Ephesus. But by the time he arrives in this city, the city of Ephesus, now we are told in chapter 19 and verse 1 that, and he happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. So by the time he arrived in this city, remember Apollos was there earlier on and Priscilla and Aquila were ministering to him and then they sent him to Corinth. And so Apollos is now in Corinth when Paul is now in the city of Ephesus. Now, what happened in this city, the city of Ephesus, as I say, he spent a lot of time in, he actually had the most success in his missionary journey, right, in all his missionary endeavor. Now, this is the city where he experienced revival. Remember the last time we learned that when he was in this city, he met many kinds of religious people, but they were kind of uh, vaguely religious. Some are superstitiously religious, but all kinds of religious people. But he ministered there. We are told, for example, in the verse 10 of chapter 19, that this continued for two years, and that is that he was teaching and preaching in the hall of Tyrannus for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So for two years in that hall, he probably preached the gospel every day to the people because that was his main job, right, as a missionary to preach the gospel and many people heard the gospel and were converted. And so it is believed that the seven churches 
that we read of in the book of Revelation or in the epistles of Revelation uh, were actually founded during this time by the Apostle Paul or through the Apostle Paul's preaching. And so he had great success uh, in this place. And Luke kind of sum up the success of his ministry in Ephesus with these words in chapter 19 and verse 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. And so there is a summary statement as it were of what actually happened in this city. So great success. Revival happened, right? Many people were converted. Many churches were started uh, during this trip. And then what happened? Now we are told uh, in the verse 21, right? Verse 21. After these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Now, this has not yet happened, but Luke kind of gave us a heads up, all right, or gave us some uh, information about what is going to happen. And that is Paul's plan, right? After this place, he is going to go through this route, and you can see there in the map, right, uh, uh, going through Macedonia, and that is uh, up there, uh, something called Northern Greece, and then Achaia, or something refers to as Greece, or Southern Greece, right? And then he goes back, and he will go back to Jerusalem. He will go back to Jerusalem. Now, you see, Paul normally goes that route, right? Meaning to say, when he completes his trips, he will go first to Jerusalem before he goes back to his home church in Antioch. But you see, his plan was that after this ministry in Ephesus, he wants to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because he has another plan. He wants to make another trip, sometimes referred to as his fourth missionary journey, which he never came back, right? And that is he's going to Rome. In fact, he has planned actually to go as far as Spain. All right, so Luke in verse 22 is just give a, giving us some, a, a picture of what is going to happen, right? But verse 23, now about that time, that is to say, in his ministry in the, the city of Ephesus, where this great uh, revival and great success in the work of the gospel, verse 23, about that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. So as usual, we see, in the story of the church, in the story of God's work, that there will always be opposition. And so we see the same here in this city. Great success, but no little disturbance. It means there's a great riot that broke out in this city. And then, now we come to chapter 20, because the remainder of chapter 19 speak of that riot that broke out and how God delivered right, the apostle Paul from that. And then the whole thing quietened down. So in verse, in chapter 20, there's the passage that now we are going to study, all right? And verse 1, now we are told, after the uproar ceased, remember the uproar or the riot? But after the riot has come down or ceased, what happened? Now Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. Now, when he had gone through those regions, I want you to kind of look at the map, right, as I read these verses, and so that you know the, 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 the path, all right, that Paul is traveling here. So he departed from Ephesus to Macedonia, all right, and uh, that is up there, right, probably visiting those cities like Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, right, up there. Then he had gone through those regions, had given much encouragement. He came to Greece, then that is to down, right? Greece, and that is to Athens and uh, Corinth, right? Down south. There he spent three months when the plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria. Where is Syria? Well, Syria means the other side, Jerusalem and Antioch, right? That is Syria. So after Corinth, he was planning to go home, right? He was set sail for Syria. But what happened? He decided to return through Macedonia. Why? Because there was a plot 
to kill him in the sea, right? So maybe some people already waiting and with some pirate boats are waiting for him. So he heard of that plan, so he decided to change his path. And so he decided to return through Macedonia. That means he went up north again. Can you see the arrow go back north again to Berea and Thessalonica and so on and Philippi? Written through Macedonia. Then verse 4. Then Luke mentioned Sopater, the Berean, son of Perihas, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, such people as Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Debi and Timothy and the Asians, Titicus and Trophimus. Now these went ahead and were waiting for us at Trias, but we set sail or we sailed from Philippi after many days of unleavened bread and in five days we came to Troas, right? You see Troas there where we stayed for seven days. Okay, let us pause and see why Luke is telling us this information. Now, why is Luke telling us these things? It's just, you know, for those who are interested, you know, in following, you know, this map and his, his uh, journey. You know, we like to follow some people on YouTube, you know, people's travel, uh, travel log, all right, or people's travel, you know, uh, what, whatever, you know. And we, we want to find out maybe about some interesting things about these places. Is that what Luke is trying to tell us? You know, Paul went to Athens and what? He discovered in Athens, great universities. He finds philosophers there. What did he see in Corinth and in Berea? Is that the reason why he is telling us this or giving us this information? Now, let me tell you that here what Luke is doing is to give us a picture or what we might say, a window into the life of the early church. Now, what? were the early Christian Christianity like? If we look at ourselves today, at the church today, what is it like? But what was it like in those days? So life in the early church is what I want to show from this chapter, right? chapter 20 of Acts. Now there are a few things I want to highlight here uh, regarding life in the early church. And the first is this the cooperation or unity among the early church, right. among the churches in the, early, you know, in the first century. Cooperation and unity among the churches in the first century. And this is shown in two ways. Now, in two ways, we see the unity and the cooperation of the churches then, even at the very beginning. I say it is shown in two ways. One, it is in their practical concern, right? In their practical concern. Now, how do we know that they, they show great love and practical concern for one another in, 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 you know, uh, in, in the churches there? Or do we have the picture or the impression that in those days, you know, churches were just basically you no know, isolationists. You know? they, they are separate from each other. They couldn't be bothered with what is going on in the other places or in the other church. Or what? Okay, let's see. I say there is this unity, this cooperation first in practical concern. Right? In practical concern. Now, you see, why, in other words, was Paul traveling to these churches? Luke tells us he went to this place, he went up there, he went down there, he visited these places and these churches. Why? For two reasons. Right? Two reasons. Number one, it is as we read later on when we see his letter uh, to the Corinthians. Right? Now look at 1 Corinthians with me in chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now, 1 Corinthians was written while Paul was still in Ephesus. Remember, when he was in Ephesus, Apollos was in Corinth. When Apollos was in Corinth, Apollos had a great ministry in the city of Corinth. Now, remember, Apollos was a great preacher. He was very eloquent, mighty in Scripture. And so he had a great following. And so the people in the, in the, in the church in Corinth, right, they probably learned a lot from Apollos. 
and they became very proud because they are able to argue with people and debate with people on various kinds of doctrine. Maybe when they meet another Christian, they say, have you heard of the doctrine of the preparation or the doctrine of uh, election or predestination and, and so on and so forth? And some Christians have never heard words like this before. And so they were very proud, right? And they go around, start looking down on other Christ Christians. And so Paul had to write a letter to them, and Paul heard of this. While he was still in Ephesus, he had to write a letter to address these problems in Corinth, telling them that they are not to let their knowledge puff up and become proud and look down on other weaker brethren. All right, when he was there, he wrote this letter to the Corinthians. But among other things, apart from addressing the issues and problems in the church, now he said in chapter 16, and look at the first few verses there. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galicia, so you are also able to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put something aside, store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collection when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. So Paul, you see, while he was ministering to these people, he had their practical needs at heart. His concern about the poor brethren he sees everywhere. That is what we see also. Now, if you have been on some missionary trips, even in the modern days, I told you, been you know for to Myanmar for many years and if you go to Myanmar maybe in Cambodia or maybe some parts of the Philippines and other places now you will see many people in the church they are very poor they have no nice clothing like us some even no clothing for the children I've seen no much food to eat and so what do we do well Paul says we must think about their needs as well, right? Don't just preach the gospel and close an eye to their physical needs, right? And so there are people who are suffering, God's people who are suffering. And so Paul wrote the letter and said that just as in the churches of Galatia, I've asked them to get a collection. And so he wrote to these churches here in Corinth that you too will take a collection. When I come, I will bring this gift back to Jerusalem. Probably at that time, they were suffering some kind of famine. And so they have great needs. And so, you see, the Christians in those days, the churches, they are concerned for one, another's, for one another in this way, in showing concern for practical needs, right? And so we see here. And then when you read 2 Corinthians, right? 2 Corinthians and chapter 8. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, 2 Corinthians was written... When Paul traveled and right, he left Ephesus, when he went up north right, to Philippi, and then he wrote a letter right, again to the Corinthians. Now then he wrote these words. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, their extreme poverty have overflowed in wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us, verse 4, earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of the saints. And these, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. So when he was in Macedonia, up there in Philippi, he wrote a letter and said, these brethren, as I come to Macedonia, they are so willing to participate in this need. And so they have already collected, even from, you know, out of their poverty. They are so willing. And so he wrote this letter, 2 Corinthians to the Corinthians again, all right? He said, telling them the other churches are all working together. And so we have a picture here. We have a picture, as Luke tells us, in Acts chapter 20. When Paul, in his travel, he went to these places. He tells us he went to this city and that city. And the reason 
he tells us in his letters, right, in these other letters, was number one, to collect money for the needy believers in the church in Jerusalem. And so that is how they show their unity. They show their oneness. Remember, there is such a thing as the local church. Yes, the local church is just one church. But the local church is part of what we call the universal church of Jesus Christ. So the universal church is made up of many local churches. right? So we are one church. right? That we are one in this one church, but we are one in Christ. Right, in this bigger church or the universal church of Christ. And we actually ought to show some kind of unity with these other churches. How do we do it? Now, we have to go to Scripture to learn how to do it. But for, um, as a matter of fact, all right, many churches just operate on their own and they think that they are the only church in this world. And so we see that the cooperation in the early churches first expressed through their practical concern, but also how else, right, did they show their unity? But secondly, it is through their co-laboring in gospel work, right, through their co-laboring in gospel work. Now, look again with me at verse 4 of Acts chapter 20. Now, look at verse 4 again. It says here, Sopater, the Berean, son of Perihas, accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, who are they? Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius, where? Of Derby and Timothy and the Asians. Probably refers to, to those from, uh, from, from Ephesus. Uh, Titicus and Trophimus. Now, question is, why does Luke interrupt his story to tell us about who were with Paul? Now, why, why, did, why does Luke interrupt here? Why don't he just continue his story and he went to this place, he did this, he did that. Why does he now pause as he will to tell us the people who, with, who were with the Apostle Paul? The reason Right, the reason is this. It tells us in his letter to the Philippians, right? Now look with me at Philippians, right? Philippians chapter 1. And look at verses 3 through 4. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Now listen. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Verse 5, Paul said, I'm thankful to God. Why? Because of your partnership. Some translation translate that word as fellowship, because it is translated from the same word, uh, where we are probably familiar, koinonia. So what is koinonia? What is fellowship? You see, fellowship in the Bible you know, has various aspects, you know, the, the meaning, you know, the shape of meaning there. And one aspect of it is that of cooperation. We work together. There is koinonia. Koinonia or fellowship is not just eating together. Afterward, we are going to have lunch fellowship. Then we think of fellowship as food, fun, and fellowship. But in the Bible, fellowship includes partnership in the gospel. And that is how the word is used here. And that is in the apostle's mind when he thinks of the many believers that he meet in his journey. This Timothy here, this Gaius here, this Secundus there, this, this person there, and from different churches. They are not from the same church. But Paul sees them as what? As co-laborers or partners in the gospel. You see, we are not alone. God has not just sent us alone to reach out to the whole world. There are many faithful servants of God in different parts of this world. And they're all serving. They're all serving the same Lord. They're all preaching the same gospel. Yes, there are many who are unfaithful. Yes, there are many who are preaching the false gospel. 
Yes, there are many who are not true servants of Christ. But that doesn't mean that there is none true servant of Christ. And so Paul, you see, he sees these people, he values the fellowship of these people, and he works together with these people. Last Sunday, Elder Chan Kim was in Malacca preaching. Next Sunday, Pastor Ho will be in Malacca preaching. You see, we work together. And then the following Sunday, Pastor Ho will be preaching here. We have sent our people to Sudan to preach. You see, we must work together as servants of Christ for the work of the gospel because we cannot do it by ourselves. Right? We cannot do it by ourselves. Now here in Malaysia, we have the Malaysia Reformed Baptist Fraternal. And in the past, we, before COVID, right, we used to meet quite regularly, like once every two months. But now it's less frequent, but we are hoping to get back to the frequency of meeting up together. Now, in Asia, we have what we call the Asian Pastors Fellowship. Where I'm in, Pastor Ho is in, Pastor Wei is in, Pastor Ishmael is in, Pastor Joseph Mangahas is in, Pastor Shiro from Tokyo is in, Pastor Thompson from Hong Kong is in, Pastor Sundra from Hyderabad is in, and we meet. When we can, we, we, we meet, we try to meet at least once a year in Singapore, but we meet through Zoom, sometimes for prayer or for some update. Working together, there are other people in other places, and we, we want to fellowship or to partner together in the gospel. Yes, as Baptist churches, right? we believe in what we call the independency of the church, that every church is independent and autonomous. But by independent churches, we do not mean isolation. Right? Yes, we are independent, we are autonomous, but we shouldn't be isolationists. We must work together and partners with others in the work of the gospel and pray for them. Right? Remember them in our prayer because they need our encouragement as well, and our prayers. And so there is one picture, right? So one thing we see in the early church, right? Cooperation among the churches. Now, what else do we see in the early church? What is it like? Now, there is a second thing I want to draw your attention to. And that is, we have Sunday in the early church. Sunday in the early church. So what did the early Christian do on Sunday? Isn't that an interesting question? We think that, you know, this Sunday gathering is maybe along the way in the tradition of the church. That's kind of, we have invented that. We have got the idea. Maybe it's a good idea for us to gather together on Sunday as if in the past and never. So what did the early Christian do on Sunday? Now, I draw your attention again to chapter 20 of Acts. Now read again verses 6 and 7. Now listen, it says here, When they arrived at Troas, at Troas, he says, But when we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Remember, all this information are given to us, whether the names of people, the name of places, the number of days. So we want to ask, right? So what is the reason for the Apostle Paul to stay seven days in Troas when he was rushing to get back to Jerusalem? In fact, he missed the Passover. So he wants to be there at least for the Pentecost. Because we see there in verse 16 of chapter 24, Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So if he was hastening, he was rushing to be back in Jerusalem, so why is he delaying here in Troas, staying for seven days? Is it because he's a beautiful city? He wants to see, you know, have more, some more sightseeing. So what is the reason? The reason is because he wanted to keep Sunday with the church. 
So he did one Sunday as well as we somewhere in the middle of the sea. We couldn't be with God's people. So he wanted Sunday, his Sunday to be with the church. Because we know from the record of the Bible of the New Testament, the Sunday is a day of worship. So it was already established at the very beginning that Sunday is the Lord's Day. And this reason why earlier on when I read from 1 Corinthians, Paul assumed that the people in Corinth, the Christians in Corinth, would gather on the first day of the week. And so he said, on the first day when you gather for worship, you take a collection. And so this first day thing, or it's in the Bible, that is a Sunday. So on the first day in verse 7 of the week, when we gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart the next day, not that day, not Sunday, but the next day, that he prolonged his speech until midnight. And so that is the reason, all right? That is the reason why he stayed longer right, in Christ so as to worship with the people of God there. In other words, the early Christians were Sunday Christians, meaning to say that they were Sunday people. They remember Sunday. Not like many Christians today, they do not remember Sunday. Sunday, they go elsewhere. Sunday, they do other things. Sunday, they maybe want to sleep. But not the Christians we see here in Acts. Sunday is the Lord's Day where the people of God gathered to worship. And so they didn't think about the maybe of going to church on Sunday. Like some people, you know, I said, we like to go to church on Sunday. They said, maybe if I'm free, I'll go to church. If I've got nothing else to do, I'll go to church. If I like it, I'll go to church. There's no maybe here. It's a priority because it is the Lord's Day. Now, how long did they meet on Sunday? Well, we are told in verse 7 that Paul prolonged his speech, his speech until midnight. Now, the word prolong, I want to be fair here, the word prolong means that this is not normal. Right? And Luke actually tells us why it's not normal, because Paul had to leave the next day, and so he didn't have much time with these people. And added to that, Paul also knew that he's not going to see these people anymore. This is the last time he's going to see them. And for these two reasons, because he's leaving the next day, and this is going to be the last sermon. And so he preached until midnight. In fact, way past midnight. Okay, So it's not normal. But nevertheless, it shows how ready the people of God in those days to remain. And Paul could have gone on. Paul could have just preached and on and on until midnight. And then by 11 p.m., he sees 10 people left. And by 12 a.m., just one left, and that is Paul himself, right? No, that was not the case, right? And so the people was at least prepared to stay on, right? In other words, there was no hurry. There are many people who are always in a hurry when they come to church. Oh, another appointment. Oh, when is the sermon going to finish? Oh, when is the service going to be over? You have fellowship, lunch, whatever. Oh, sorry, sorry, I cannot stay because I have something to do. You see, yeah, we might say, though we live in a different time, you know, this is a busy age, right? Everybody is very busy. And so, therefore, we do not have much time to stay on for fellowship and for, for church. Really? Is it a matter of no time? Or is it a matter of priority? And so for them, right, they met in an unhurried manner. Where did they meet? We also learned that, right? They met not in a nice auditorium like many churches today, you know, the, you know these state of art facilities, air condition, you know, and, uh, and so on, nice comfortable chairs. But we are told, Right, we are told in verse 8, there were many lambs in the upper room where they gathered. So they were gathering in the upper room. So we always heard of the upper room. They're probably gathering in a house where there is one room up there, maybe kind of rooftop or something like that. All right? And they all cram up there. All right? And they were listening to Paul preaching. 
there was no lights like this. They were using oil lamps. And so Luke mentions that there were many lamps in the upper room. And so that is the place they met. Upstairs, or third floor, lighted by oil lamp. I say no electric lighting, no piano, no comfortable chair, no many of the things that we have today. So that is where they met. What did they do when they meet? What did they do when they meet? Isn't that also an important question? Churches ask this question all the time. What should we do when we gather as a church? Oh, let's do a survey all right, and find out what people like to do. You like to hear some music? You like someone to come up and sing? So like some dancing or like magic show? What, what do you like? They didn't ask those questions. So what did they do when they meet? Well, Luke tells us, right? Luke tells us, well, they listened to preaching. Paul was preaching. The people were there in the upper room. They were listening to preaching. They were not listening to, a perfor- to, to, to music or to watching a performance. No, that was not what they were doing. Were they disappointed? Were the people, when they were all gathered, you know, imagine the upper room and, and, and they begin to see Paul coming up, were they disappointed when Paul went on preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching? And they say, oh, we came to the wrong place. This is the wrong place. Huh? I, I'd rather go to another church where there are a lot of other things happening. We have a variety show up here. Uh, not Paul up there and preaching and never stop. What happened when Paul was preaching? Verse 9. As Paul was preaching, we are told, a young man named Eutychus sitting at the window sank into deep sleep. As Paul talked still longer, and being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So that was what happened in the church. When Paul was preaching and preaching and preaching, and then there is young man, and this by the word there, the word young man really been a very young man, maybe 13, 14 years old. Anyone 13, 14 years old here? No, Aria, all right, 13, 14 years old. Good, I mean, you are in church. Because we know in those days, 13, 14, they are in church. We only think church for old people. You know, young people, they don't like church. But we find him here. But we see him right here, and he was listening to preaching, and then he fell asleep. Oh, Aria, I'm not falling asleep. <laughs> and he fell asleep. All right. There are many reasons why people fall asleep, right? In church. So we need maybe sometime to talk about this, like answering the question, why do people fall asleep in church and how to overcome that? <laughs> maybe a discussion question for Bible study. So why do people fall asleep? Now, today there are many reasons. Sometimes the air condition or so cooling. Right? <laughs> or sometimes it's no con- air condition also sleep. I don't know what to do. Give you air condition or sleep. No air condition also sleep, right? Or maybe some people had too much breakfast this morning and so you are sleepy, right? Or maybe you just watch Euro <laughs> 24, 2024, right? England versus Spain, right? Oh, good thing it didn't happen last night. Otherwise, this morning, somebody will be falling asleep, right? So there are many reasons why people fall asleep. So how do we overcome that? Maybe there are many uh, ways to help people wake up from their sleep. One, maybe to tell you all, you know, when you see your neighbor fall asleep, poke the person right by the side, right? Or pinch the person, right? Or maybe the pastor should start calling names. I see somebody nodding head, right, agreeing with you. You say, yes, what are you agreeing about, all right? There are many ways to overcome, all right? But this young man fell asleep. But to be fair to this young man, actually Luke hindered the reason why this young man actually fell asleep. Not simply because Paul was preaching until midnight, but actually he gave us the information in verse 8 that there were many lambs in the upper room so as a scientist, right, he knows that this can affect, the, you know, the environment can affect. The, 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 the oil lamp was sucking up all the oxygen you know, from the atmosphere and that can cause people to be drowsy, right? So Luke is saying that, well, 
well, there are sometimes legitimate reasons, all right? Well, sometimes people are really sick, you know, there's some medication, they fall asleep. So don't always be judgmental when a person falls asleep in church, all right? There could be legitimate reasons. All right, so but what did Paul do when this young man fell asleep and then fell down from the third floor dead? So what did Paul do? Well, it's interesting actually what Paul did when this young man fell down three, uh, from the third floor and died. Verses 10 and 11 tells us, verse 10. But Paul went down and bent over him, taking him in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Verse 11. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. Now this is important for us to take note of. Now, you can imagine what today people would do in the church when someone suddenly falls down and dies. And then Paul comes, lay him, his body over this young man, and then make him alive again. Now, what do you think would happen today in maybe most churches? But that did not happen here. Now, let me tell you what happened here. What happened here? is that Paul went, raised this man, and then he continued preaching. Isn't that interesting? That Paul raised this man up, in other words, healed this man, and he continued preaching. That was how Paul and how the church reacted. How did the church react? The church, we are told here, they just continue and listen to the preaching of the Apostle Paul. Now, see, I expect what might happen in many churches today when this happened is that they will say to Paul, forget the preaching, let us have a healing rally, right? We can heal. And we go around everywhere, maybe, you know, telling people we have a healing ministry. Paul never did that. And the church in the, in, in the first century, they never thought about that. But this focus was on the word of God. In other words, in other words, this is Sunday in the early church. It was a priority for the people of God. They met, and the reason they met was to listen to preaching, not to see miracles. They could have, but they did not. And so nothing we see here could distract them from the hearing of the word of God. You see, so many things today can distract us from hearing the word of God, especially miracles, but not the church in the first century. And so we learn something about the first century church, all right, life in the early church. But there's a third thing I want to draw your attention to concerning life in the early church, and it is this leadership. Leadership. Now, you see, we are told how the early, church, the early churches were organized and what kind of people led the early church. And so we see in verse 17, right, in verse 17, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. Now, you see, you look at the map and the travel, so he was going back, right? And Troas up there, he was going down, but he didn't want to go back to Ephesus. So instead, he went to Miletus, right, below Ephesus there. He went to Miletus. But he called the elders from Ephesus to come down, and it was something like a 70 kilometers journey. Remember, they didn't drive. And so they had to walk about 70, 80 kilometers down to meet Paul, in my letters, now what do we learn about leadership in the church? Well, firstly, we learn that the churches were led by elders. The churches were led by elders. So that's why we read in verse 17 about elders and then in verse 28. In verse 28, pay careful attention to yourself and to all the flocks in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, 
which he obtained with his own blood. The Holy Spirit has made you what? Overseers. The word overseers is the word sometimes translated or elsewhere translated as bishops. It's okay if you understand bishop as overseers, but it is not okay if you understand bishop the way many people or most people understand bishops today. Today we have bishops and archbishops and all kinds of bishops. Today churches are led by all kinds of people. They are led by people with various kinds of titles, maybe cardinal or canon, heard of canon, right? and so on. right? But in those days, they were simply called elders. So the elders right, were summoned by Paul to come down to Miletus to meet with Paul. The elders or the overseers are not people with a special stick with a twist on the top. They are not people with special clothing. They are not people with a collar. Maybe a bit sensitive on some Baptists with a collar. I'm a Baptist. <laughs> or with some kind of hat or headgear. Right? That is not the picture we see here. Right? So they were elders. Those are the people who led the church. Those are the people who led the church. Now, what is their main job? Now, what is their main job? I mean, these are important questions, not just interesting, but important questions. What do pastors do? I have people who ask me time and times again, all right, uh, what do you do as a pastor? So sometimes we have to think that you know, we have to crack our head and say, you know, apart from preaching, uh, let me think, let me think, you know, what else do I do as a pastor? So what do they do? What's, what is their main job? Are they educators or some, some people in charge of an orphanage? Or are they administrators? Or are they CEO? Are they president? Or are they chairman? Or are, they, are they what? Well, I say in verse 28, they are overseers who shepherd the flock of God. Right? So the word shepherd, uh, shepherd the flock of God. So they are overseers who shepherd, and when the shepherd translated here is to care for. Shepherd, sometimes translated as feed, as in 1 Peter 5. Feed the flock of God. Now when feeding, you say, what do mothers do? And mothers sometimes, also, like pastor, we have the same problem. Right? People ask you, what do mothers do? Mothers will say, apart from feeding my baby, what do I do? Huh? What do I do? Huh? We feed. So pastors, mothers, we feed the flock, right? We feed people. And so later when advising Timothy, when he wrote to Timothy, he wrote this verse, reminding Timothy of the primary role of the pastor. So what is the primary role of the pastor? Well, Paul wrote these words to Timothy and said, I charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season, an hour of season, rebuke, uh, reproof, rebuke, exhort, with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching years, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passion and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. But as for you, verse 5, always be sober-minded and your suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So what is his ministry? What is his primary calling? Feed the flock. Preach the word. And so that is the primary job of the elders. And so Paul gathered this Leaders, they are called elders, they shepherd the flock. The main job is to teach, to preach the word of God. What kind of people, what kind of leadership did they have? What kind of leadership do we have these days in churches? You see, in the early church, all kinds of people actually can be leaders of the church. They could be fishermen, carpenters, slaves bus driver, they all can be church leaders. Now, if you look at some churches' website, 
and look at the church constitution under the you know, clause or article on leadership. Now, some churches actually have this qualification. They look at the academic or qualification. Graduated from where? No, in the Bible, all kinds of people can be leaders of the church. If, verse 19 of chapter 20, if serving the Lord with all humility, if they are humble, if, verse 20, how I did not string from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, if they are faithful in declaring the whole counsel of God. As Paul mentions in verse 27, I did not string to declare to you the whole counsel of God. If they are faithful, in other words, to teach the word of God, not their favorite topic, not their favorite subject, but to teach the whole counsel of God. This is the reason why here we preach from the Bible. We alternate between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We open the Bible and we explain it to you. That is the work of a church leader, the elders in the church. And so anyone could be, I say, a leader in a church if they were humble and if they were diligent to teach the whole counsel of God. And if, verse 30, what does verse 30 say? It says here, verse 30, And from among your own self will arise men speaking, twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. There will be people who will be in the church, who want to be leaders in the church. And what is their goal? What is their purpose? The purpose is to draw people to themselves. They want a following. They want when their sermon is on YouTube, they want to have thousands of views. They want on their X account a lot of followers. No, you see, Paul says, their concern is not to seek their own glory. Anyone, I say, could be a leader in the church if they were humble, if they are faithful in declaring the whole counsel of God, and if they did not seek their own glory. They are not here to be famous. We have in these days celebrity pastors. Celebrity means they can mix around with all the other celebrities. But not so. Not so in the New Testament. And then later on, Paul actually gives us a complete list of who qualifies to be a leader or an elder in the church in this letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and then to Titus in Titus chapter 1. So he gives us a complete list. But here he's just telling us some of the qualities. So what kind of people were the leaders in the church? We see it here. Finally, there is one more thing about life in the early church. And that is the love and the born among the Christians. Look at the last few verses, verse 36. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that he would not see his face again and they accompanied him to the ship. The love and the bond among Christians in the early church. They were this gospel bond. They were all one, united in the gospel. They were this bond in the spirit, as later Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians, that, that it is born in the spirit of God. There is this sense of belonging, that we belong together. As opposed to the people of the world, we are the people of God. We are family. We are family. We are one in Christ. We see in the early church, they traveled together. They worshiped together. They met together. They cared for one another. And they miss each other. Is that a mark today? Where Christians actually miss one another? Look again in these verses here. Verse 38, being sorrowful, most of all. Right? They were sorrowful when they were leaving, when Paul was leaving, and they were hugging each other. 
they always, in other words, miss church when they miss church. They always miss church when they miss church. There are many people who are missing, but they do not miss us. But they do not miss us. But it's not so here, right? It's not so here. So the early church was united with one another, committed to the worship of God, where preaching was central and led by spiritual leaders. Let us pray for such churches today. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your work as we see in the early church. Lord, how you have used your people to build up your churches. Lord, we pray for the same today. We pray for ourselves. Help us not to just read this and forget about it, but remember these are written for us that we might learn and to be what you want us to be. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.